What's up, nerds? Welcome to continued coverage of GP Brussels live from Belgium. You're in the booth with me, Ronnie Knight. Joining me, my good friend and colleague, Simon Gertzen. Sorry to insult you in that way, Simon. Good friend. Oh. Yeah, I don't want to okay. don't, don't tie you with that brush. In our feature match area, we have Walter Biesmans and Florian Koch, another friend of yours. Absolutely, yeah. Back uh, from the city of Aachen, where I spent the majority of my life. And he's on the deck that I've been criticizing. <laughs> So clearly, Just now. you can see how much regard he has for your uh, your thoughts and feelings when it comes to deck choice there, Simon. No, I'm, I'm of course, I'm in contact with Florian. We uh, talk a lot about mm -hmm. uh, metagame developments of all kinds of formats. We have our Slack channels uh, busy. But like I said, I still think you don't necessarily want to be playing Steel Leaf Stompy right now. But maybe Florian can show us otherwise. Really not mucking around with your preparation using Slack, huh? Of course. You wouldn't, you just know WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, no? no? Only the most professional tools The true, true collaboration tool for you. Yes, there you go. Well. We tried Discord for a while. How'd that go? <laughs> Too casual for you, I Yeah. Imagine. Too it's much more fun. You know, it's just for these uh, gamer types. You look at the loading screen for it and you're like, I don't understand this reference. Constructing additional pylons? I don't like it. Seems to have some kind of humor in it. You know, Slack was the first company ever to be valued a billion dollars? No, I didn't. I think, I think it was the first, no, no, first to be, I think, to be seated yeah, that, by VCs okay, yeah, at, at a billion dollars. The first thing you said yeah, didn't, didn't make, didn't any, make sense. any sense. Ba basically, it comes from the ancillary reading I did after watching season five of Silicon Valley. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's where most people's knowledge of startups comes from. Hey, I t I, I've got an interesting story to tell you about uh, the uh, startups and, and VCs. We'll see if we've got time for it because it's a real cracker. But right now, Florian Koch is on the board with a 3-2. Vol Walter Biesman's playing pretty slowly here with his white-blue control list. <coughs> mm. Florian actually bluffed the elephant on turn one. Oh, yeah. And then uh, oh, decided the to go for the, the, shy <laughs> for the scrounger the instead. The shy little elephant. He pops down. Whoop, away he goes. Uh, um, Florian actually with the turn two Lanner uh, on the draw. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw him rip the top that off the top of his library. It's not, not the turn uh, upon which he wanted. So we'll see what uh, Cock wants to do after getting in for three here. He's going to play the green belt or rampager here. Shy little elephant. This time looks like it'll... Uh, Actually, make the trip and uh, and survive the the cameras. No, not this time. Syncopate for two. So still a Lanawar elves that can be deployed here by Koch. Looks like he's going to go for it here. So Beesman's levering, uh, leveraging some counter magic there. So Simon, many years ago, used to work as a tour guide, and once I had to give a a private tour to a gentleman from South Korea, and uh, I was you know making conversation, being polite, asked him what he did. He said he was. In, in town to meet with some people. I was like, oh, you know, what, what's uh, just business meetings. Oh, what do you, oh, in VC. And I'm like, oh, venture capitalism. I know all about that because I've watched Silicon Valley. So I'm making a chat, having a bit of a chat with him. <coughs> I was like, oh, who are you meeting with? And he said, oh, I'm meeting with the CEO of Skype and I've got to meet with Angela Merkel, the German <laughs> chancellor, tomorrow. I'm like, ah, okay, that's cool. So who exactly do you do VC for? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm the president of Samsung. And uh, yeah, he's a good dude. He was a good dude. Bought me lunch, which I appreciated, but uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely gave me something to think about. Because you know, I was intending to to uh, impress him with my knowledge of, of of the German history, the history of Berlin. I could I, I walk past the apartment where Angela Merkel lives, but he just blow me out of the water because he's going to the the washing machine chancellery and just meeting her in her office. So, anyway, getting for three now, four, I should say, Florian Koch. Lana Elves on beatdown mode. Not exactly what you want to do, Simon. Well. You've got to take uh, what you can get, and it kind of makes uh, settle the wreckage. You can you can turn uh, turn those land rolls into a into a land. And a steel leaf champion now as a five four to apply additional pressure. Beesman, however, if he can leverage any kind of mass removal here, no, he's going to go for the uh, the seal away blink of an eye combo here. Ve I don't like that too much. Yeah, very very defensive approach. Uh, seal away after taking damage. Blink of an eye, unkicked, no extra card drawn. That explains it. Otherwise, I would have much preferred to mm. see Blink of an eye with kicker, untap, uh, seal away the the scrounger. Does make a lot of sense to make that tempo-oriented play there, getting a Teferi down that is uncontested. Actually, if, uh, if Valta doesn't have anything to do with the two mana, he could have still sealed away uh, with the Teferi. Actually, that's true. Yeah. But, yeah. but if he is holding now, if he's only counter magic, for example, then... Uh, this would be understandable. Look at this. We've got Blossoming Defenses on Shock Mode here. And a second one as well to take, get, take down the Teferi altogether. 
Taste the Teferi. Very aggressive play here from Koch. And of course, after the first one resolved, the, uh, the second one is surely safe. Yep. No, and um, it might look weird, but these control decks are so reliant on Teferi, just like, just like the Fog decks, actually, that um, taking Teferi out with all you have is, is often worth it. Florian had to uh, choose between that line and deploying his 5-4 his again. Mm. So you can see how much he values that. Yeah, getting the Teferi off the board is, a, is quite a coup here for Koch. It did cost him two cards. And Beesman has obviously replaced the Teferi itself with uh, its plus ability. But I don't know. I, I like that line. It's, it's risky, but ultimately paid off. And now Koch can unload more pressure. It's, it's aggressive. But if you imagine him having a 5-4 and those blossoming defenses in hand, and the Teferi would uh, be around, then suddenly Vauter can just uh, do what he wants to do anyway, which is protect Teferi at all costs. And with every, mm. every one of his spells, he's just protecting Teferi and pulling further and further ahead. It's, I think that uh, Vauter is still favored here, mostly because of the search for Ascanta mm. and the chance to just find uh, another Teferi. But I like, I like this line by, by Florian. He's done a good job of keeping the board relatively clear, protecting his assets, both his uh, planeswalkers and his uh, uh, and his life total. Although uh, Koch has really put both under siege so far, with Beesman's already down to twelve. He hasn't found any further lands here. Cast out in hand, of course. We saw commit to memory already played. There it is on your screen. You may see that cast out cycled away. Yes, indeed. Look so that's card number seven in the graveyard. Okay. Relevant for Ascanta. Something you will uh, you will see is players opting not to flip Ascanta if they know for sure that they're not going to activate it this turn. But here, uh, Walter really wants to get um, access, wants to see as many cards as possible. Meandering River off the top here. So his mana continues to develop, and that's what the control player wants. But yeah, as you say, if there's a, a play that they're almost certainly locked into, often they'll reap the reward of having, that it doesn't need an extra mana, they'll reap the reward of having another Search for Ascanta trigger next turn. But it looks like Beesman's just going to play another Search for Ascanta by itself here. So another little pseudo-scry action for him. Didn't get a good look at that last card in hand there, Simon. Uh, we, we will see it soon enough. Uh, I think Valter is um, just relying on that Ascanta. Florian has, the, has a big issue, though. If you look at his hand, he has another Blossoming defense, probably the reason why he was so aggressive in using it, but also two Galtas. Ooh. That's, uh, well, got a backup now when the first one gets disallowed. it can be difficult to deploy it, however. On turn 11? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little tricky. Some of the draws, though, from the Steel Leaf Stompy deck. Oh, busted. You can get a, a Galtar out in turn 4. Magical Christmas Land. No, it's not even really Magical Christmas Land. It's more like, I don't know, Magical 19th or 20th of December Land? It's not, it's not mm -hmm. as far-fetched as all that. Magical Christmas is not like turn three. Is there a one on turn three? A kill? No, no, no. A Galta. A, a Galta on turn three. Probably yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's Magical Christmas land. That's Magical Boxing Day land. Oh, that's time. actually... Like, if you, if you can really sculpt your draw and deck in any way possible, it's not that hard, I think. See what Beesman's up to now. There's this weird one mana 3-3 three, three that... Uh, Gives your opponent a basic land or something like that. Oh yeah, the, uh, the which you would never play. The uh, old old growth dryads. Yeah, but if you really want to get that Galta on turn three, you can you can make it work. I think. So play that on turn one. Play two on turn two, and then on turn three, yeah, Galta, easy, easy game. Easy your game. Your opponent drops uh, Fumigate <laughs> with counter backup, but <laughs> yeah, because they because they've got ten lands in play. <laughs> oh dear, he's to ferry the hero of Dominaria. Yep. Once again, Beesman's going to be all in on protecting this giant threat that he's got. Teferi, wow, what a house, what a card. The second coming of the Planeswalker is probably going to spell doom for Koch here. Teferi and Ascanta, we've, we've seen this countless times. So Teferi is not only crazy good, you get plus loyalty, plus a card, and you get two extra mana, but it also synergizes incredibly well with um, Ascanta. Mm. And, uh, for example, Gift of Paradise, the Fog. So, in this particular format, it's, this ability might actually be even better than it already is. It's just insane. This card is so good. It's the blue-white Planeswalker that, we've, uh, that we deserve after years and years of, of languishing with Nasa Transcendent, Dovin Barn. I guess Vansa, the Sojourner, was okay. C completely unbiased commentary by... Well, as ever. Blue-white <laughs> lover. Enthusiast. Enthusiast. <laughs> 
Absolutely. No, I loved Ferry. Great to play with him. I was uh, slamming some modern side events uh, yesterday with my Teferi. Ask me how I went. How did you go? In matches oh, overall, one and five. That's a win. I did get a win on the board. Yeah. It was my first one too. I was like, oh, I, I, this is my day at the races. And then I just lost and lost and lost. Were you giving out boosters for the uh, people that beat you? No, not in the side events. I was doing that during spell slinging. But, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I generally gave people boosters whether I beat them or not. Because if I beat them, oh, geez, I felt bad. No one deserves to lose to me. Here's Essence Scatter now from this, uh, as, as counted, Sunken Ruin. Another Teferi in hand. Looks like Beesman's well and truly locked this one up. And Cock, reading the writing on the wall, he goes, yep, all right, let's mm -hmm. go to game two. Imagine going home after a GP and thinking everyone got a booster from Riley except for me. Because they're the one that you beat. Oh, they're the one that I beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a rough beat. That's a real rough beat. I do apologize to, uh, to that opponent. Playing humans, though, against Jesco, it's a good matchup. Let's have a look at the sideboards here for Florian Koch. Four copies of Duress and three copies of Hour of Glory. One of the real draws to playing black is the sideboard cards that you gain access to, and, and especially those two there. Yes, I'm not so sure. Like, I, would, I would put it a little bit differently. Okay. I would say the main draw to playing black is Scrap Heap Scrounger, mm -hmm. and then you're just looking for the single black cards to make your side, which, which should make your sideboard. And then Duress and Hour of Glory are top choices. Because you, you can't play Vraska's Content. No. Uh, double Black is out of, the op out of the question. And Hour of Glory, I think we see it probably not often enough. No, I mean, it deals with more or less everything. That y well, can't point it at Planeswalkers critically, but it just getting a Hazard off the battlefield, exiling a, a Rekindling Phoenix is huge. I, in the Mirror Match, you can take out anything yeah. uh, up to a Galta. So uh -huh. it, it, has, uh, it has its uses. It's not quite Doomblade, but uh, it is a very powerful card. Not as good in this matchup, of course. What else do we have? Two copies of Nissa Vital Force, double Sorceress Spyglass as well. Two copies of Vivian Reed, and then Thrashing Brontidon and Vine Mare as singletons. Thrashy B, Viney M. <laughs> we haven't seen Viv do too much work here. Uh, Vivian Reed? No. So this looks like the classical plan uh, with your creature deck to board into a more Planeswalker midrange uh -huh, uh -huh. strategy that can be really, really strong against uh, control decks, especially if you catch them with the wrong answers in hand. So, for example, to rest their negate, drop a, drop a Planeswalker on five. And I have to say, I like this matchup a lot better after sideboarding. Yeah, it's interesting to see that f that uh, Koch has gone for both Nissa Vital Force and Vivian Reed. There were some pundits who were saying that maybe Vivian Reed would replace Nissa as the five-drop non-creature threat of choice for green decks. But Koch has, yeah, gone for the two-and-two two split. And I guess both attack from different angles. The, the legendary rule is, is still a thing. So yeah. okay, that's a good point. Ma maybe you just want to press your advantage. Sorcerer Spyglass is um, probably in his sideboard b against the Turbo Fog decks, but I would mm -hmm. bring it in against Red Bull Control yeah, sure. in, a, in a heartbeat. Just name Teferi and, uh, and get it done. Always name Teferi. Let's have a look at Valta Biesman's sideboard here. Three copies of Lyra Dawnbringer, so he's really looking to, uh, to solidify that red match up there. <coughs> Double Forsake the Worldly, double History of Benalia, two Negates, two Torrential Gearhawks to go with the one in the main deck. And then Walking Ballista, Sorcerer Spyglass, Jace's Defeat, and Ether Meltdown, all as one-offs. Random kind of one Ether Meltdown there. Yeah, and not too many cards that I love against Mono Green, no, I have to say. No, definitely not here. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot that's really going to get it done. I mean, Walking Ballista is... I mean... No, it's not. I was going to say no, fun in turn I, two, I can't but see even, that, even no. then, no, it just kind of sticks. I can see the torrential Gilhogs to yep. just play a um, harder hitting control game. Mm -hmm. I can even see the Lyras. Uh, sure, it, it does nothing against Galta, but the rest of the of the green creatures it does stop um, quite effectively. Yeah, and it holds them off real nice. The the thing is, do you bring in uh, creature removal? against blue-white control. It's always one of these tricky questions. I like the Lyras for another reason as well. Uh, I think Beesman's can safely anticipate that Koch will be bringing in Duresses. I think that's a, that's a safe bet. So against Duresses, against Spyglasses, against Planeswalkers, it's really, really good. Because Lyra against don't bring a, with first strike, holds off even uh, Steel Egg Champion. And the, uh, also the Vine Maris with Hexproof. Oh, of course. That's so a really good point. I think there are, there are a bunch of reasons to bring her in. Mm -hmm. um, I can see a few reasons not to. Because in the end, if the mono green, depending on the draw the mono green player has, the Lyra is, is just a speed bump. Or, or maybe not even that. Because, yeah. because of Galtas, Galta. because of Ronas, yeah. even uh, Blossoming Defense. Check this out, Simon. Double Hour of Glory in Cox's hand here. He's brought both of them in. I was, uh, was going to mention exactly that, because if he expects 
Lyros after sideboarding, yeah. uh, and he oh. has this. Excuse me, thrashing Brontodon is a three of. <laughs> I got confused there because you know this on on uh, the hour of glory. There's the scorpion god in his tail, sort of goes up around the side. Yes, I miss saw it, and instead it was actually thrashing Brontodon's neck coming up around the left hand side okay. of the screen. So an easy mistake to make. A very easy mistake. They're almost the same. Card. Almost the same card. <laughs> um, if you're colorblind. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. He can tick that particular box. <laughs> no, we we understand. I think it's it's actually three of them. Yeah, right? three. I can he's see the tail. He's just I can see that. You can see. You can see this tail. Scorpion's tail. See, I would have a claim to it if Hour of Glory were red, because <laughs> the red and the green card uh, frames are very difficult to tell apart for people who are colorblind, like me. But uh, no, it uh, it looks like it's going to be a thrashing Brontodon as well. No, uh, but uh, this is um, what I was going to say. If you expect your opponent to bring in something like a Lyra and you think you are going to have trouble against troubles against it, then it, it might be correct to bring in one or two answers. Um, I think it's more relevant, for example, for the red decks that really want that unlicensed disintegration to, to keep Lyra away. Vivian Reed also in the hand of Florian Koch by the look of things. Shooting things down from the sky. She's another answer to the, uh, to the Lyra Dawnbringer as well. Destroy target artifact enchantment or uh, creature with flying, as you can see there. So another way to deal with opposing Lyras. Very green effect. Very green effect. Here's a duress now. Let's see what Beesman's working with. I like the timing. Um, the turn before Teferi can come down, the turn where Settle the Wreckage is a threat. Um, Ooh, yeah. Counter magic up. I, it's kind of the perfect, the perfect uh, duress timing. Three lands, three spells. Three colorless lands? Yeah. What do you take here? Well, you can't take the Gearhog, so that makes it, I think, makes it easy. I would be a bit more afraid of Disallow, or rather, I would take Disallow just on the uh, basis that it's one mana cheaper. Okay. And if something gets committed here, it, it kind of depends on what you're, uh, what you're planning to follow up with. Mm. But if you attack with Sealif Champion, and it, it, or, or Heart of Kieran is probably even better, and Vauter commits it, that's a fair trade. Looks like the disallow is the pick here for Cock. <coughs> so a good call from you there, Simon. Well, I think it's I think it's really close. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably not even all that relevant, but oh, it actually looks to be so close that the judge has been called in to ask if uh, if Cock can get some takesies backsies here. We will let the judge ultimately make that ruling. But Simon, a, a testament to what you were saying there about the decision being enormously close. Looks like Cock. Went after the disallow and then has, seems to have changed his mind and is conferring with the judge as to whether it's too late to instead replace uh, the it with a commit. And looks like it is not too late. Okay. So very close call there made by the German. And here is a scrap heap scrounger. That enables that heart of Kieran to attack. And that's probably... No. It, it, honestly, I don't think it makes that, that big of a difference. But this way, Florian forces the counter on the scrounger. Mm. Uh, as opposed to, for example, a commit on the heart of Kieran, which would be maybe slightly better for Wouter. But um, I think the difference is really marginal. I don't know. It seems pretty bad for Beesman's to counter that Scrape Heap Scrounger because obviously it's a nice sticky recursive threat. The Scrounger will almost certainly be coming back again for another bite of this particular cherry. Yeah, but what would he have done with the, with the commit is the question. I mean, even committing, as you say, the Heart of Kieran once it's... But then the... But then the Scrounger is in play. Still on the so battlefield, yeah. And you know your opponent is drawing that Heart of Kieran. I guess that ultimately you, dr you, you gain yourself a lot more time here. I like this as well from Beesman's. He doesn't have anything useful to do with his mana this turn, so he's just going to go after Koch's mana base and force the issue. Now Koch cut off from green mana. Black mana. Sorry, black mana. He's not playing any swamps. Well, but he's fired over duress and... Uh, the Scrounger doesn't have a fodder in the graveyard yet. Again, in my defense, very difficult to tell Swamps and Forest apart. So Koch, double Thrashy B in hand. Don't know what that last card is, though. Not a land, certainly. And Vivian Reed off the top here. It's uh, Steely for Champion. Oh, is Steely. It's the last card. Steely C. Had to decide between the L and the C there. Went for the C. I think it's got a better, better cadence to it. So Cock can continue to develop his board here with another 5-4. Vivian Reed a long way away from being cast here. 
And with only one unknown card in Beesman's hand, this is a relatively safe investment mm -hmm. to the battlefield. And he's actually um, not playing a five power creature here because the Threshing Bronton is big enough to crew the Heart of Kirin. Mm -hmm. So no need to expose uh, your most powerful creatures to um, counter magic or mass removal. Or next turn if Beesman yeah, rips a, a Fumigate or something like that could be bad news. So Koch gets in. Beesman's down to two now. Rough stuff for him. Here's a Forsake the Worldly. Ooh. I mean, it does exile Scrap Heap Scrounger at least. Can also take care of that Heart of Kieran, but this is not going to be enough here. He's got a Torrential Gehawk to block. But Koch can just slam this 5-4 uh, this into play or even just another Thrashing Bronze and get in for lethal. Yeah, we, and with three creatures and the particular graveyard that Voucher has, hmm. I think it's you know that you have a Torrential Gear Hulk beat, so you don't even have to worry about it. Koch does, of course, know about the Torrential Gear Hulk. I guess he's just wondering about which cards he has to worry. This does not look like a lethal attack, however. No, Beesman's will live to, to fight another day here. Oh, no, of course, because the Thrashing Brontodon can destroy the Gear Hulk before it, uh, before it blocks. Nice. Full, uh, full information, or at least yep. all the information required there for Koch to to win the game. Making things very easy there, and uh, Koch equalizes one and one with Beesman's going down to an early aggressive start. Much more convincing display there from Koch as uh, as he was really able to turn the screws, apply a lot of pressure, and that duress also not just the value of removing the counter spell from his hand, but also gave Koch a lot of information as to how best to maneuver those combat steps. No, I I agree. Uh, it's Without question that this matchup is uh, a lot better, like significantly better after sideboarding. And add to the fact that Walter probably rightfully so didn't expect a lot of uh, Steel Leaf Stompy decks at this event and doesn't have a particular good, particularly good sideboard against it. Beesman's has got to rely more heavily, or at least draw, I think is step number one, his mass removal here. Settle the wreckage, fumigate, obviously, a nice catch-all answer to everything. And, uh, you know, it, it's all very well to go one for one with counter spells, with, uh, with things like cast out or seal away, but ultimately I think the threat density of the Steel Leaf Stompy deck, in addition to the disruption of Duress, it makes it very difficult for White Blue Control to play its normal one for one game. Absolutely. You... you what we need to see, what we need to look at is now Voucher being on the play and really kind of curving out in a controlly way. Mm -hmm. So, for example, cards he really wants to see are Search for a Scanter yep. on two, then a card draw on four, mm -hmm. and then, of course, as always, Teferi on five. Yes, yes, and, and peppering in removal counter spells, whatever, what have you, and gaps in the curve there are going to be what he wants. But I don't know, the Steel Leaf Stompy deck is... Well, we talked about it having a little bit of a weakness against the field overall. It's very good against the uh, the mono blue list, but just has basically no way to win against Turbo Fog. It's not fast enough to prevent the, the Fog deck from getting into gear, and they're not resilient enough to be able to punch through damage once things are, are up and rolling. So, And even the matchup against red is not uh, trivial. It's not spectacular, no. With, this, uh, with this deck. Well, in any case... Koch sitting pretty at 5-1. and one. A great start to his tournament so far. Absolutely. And with all the talk we have here in the booth about the meta game and uh, what is this weekend's, you know, uh, right deck choice, it's, it's always a matter of what did you prepare for, how did you prepare, uh, which deck do you have the most reps in with? So if you've been uh, practicing Steel Leaf Stompy for the last three weeks, I completely understand that this is the deck that you want to uh, bring to the bring to the tournament, maybe even knowing that it's not perfectly positioned. Players, look at their opening hands here. Sam, would you like to hear a story about the time that I played Florian Kolk at a GP? Please. I was playing a white-green deck, uh, and I was playing Nissa, Vast would see it. This is the three-drop Nissa creature that flips into a Planeswalker. Mm -hmm. From Magic Origins. Uh, yes. So I'm playing, shuffling up, whatever else, draw my opening hand, and I realize, oh no, I busted a sleeve. I'm like, okay, all right, no worries. I'll very carefully, right, because obviously I don't want to give away what the card is. You see where this is going immediately. I, I think I got it. I'll very carefully remove the card from its sleeve, put it face down, so Koch has no mm -hmm. idea what I'm playing. He's not going to have a He's clue. He's not going to have a clue, right? So I'm like, I just need... Uh, Florian, sorry, mate. I've just broken a sleeve. I'll just replace it really quick. He's like, no worries at all. Unsleeve one of the cards in my sideboard, pull out the card, uh, the sleeve of which I'd broken in my main deck, and laid the Nissa Sage Animist, <laughs> face down on the battlefield. She flips into Sage Animist, right? 
And so uh, Cox just looks at it, goes, "Yep, okay," and uh, crushed me. And then wrote about my mistake in his tournament report. Oh, that's a nice touch. Yeah, he really, uh, he really let me know. He's scrap heap scrounger for the German now. Certainly didn't let me walk away with that one for free. Certainly paid the price there. Beesman's having ca uh, cycled away this cast out. What do you think of this hand? Got a lot of a uh, lot of powerful cards, but no ways to cast them. Um, that just looks atrocious to me. Oh no! Double, double white, double blue, <laughs> and a five drop, and your <laughs> and a field of ruin. your mana base is a plains and a field of ruin. It has it has potential. Mm -hmm. Has potential. Has potential. Yes. Step one is probably to fetch an island with that field of ruin. So scrap heap scrounger comes across. But Field of Ruin is, is just one of the best constructed cards printed in the last years. That's a huge call. Yeah, but look, I mean, the, the text on this card is oh, just brilliant. no. Koch had the option there to play a forest to deny the Field of Ruin activation for Beesman. <laughs> I mean, he can't know, right? But still, no need to play that Hashap Oasis there. Yeah. And a Green Belt I, Rampage. I agree. Now. So Beesman's can take advantage of this, uh, this play here by Koch. I'm not going to call it a mistake, because he, I, I think... No, mista we, you, you can't, can't call it a mistake. You can't call it a mistake. But, uh, if, um, he th doesn't. The first question is whether you, whether you thought about it, and the second, the second question is if you decided uh, against it. Beesman's choosing not to go after the Hashap Oasis there, which I, I have to say, Simon, I don't like. It would have meant that he would have had Disallow up this turn, although it seems like he's just desperately digging for land, cycling away. Yeah, he, he, he probably figured he needs to draw lands anyway because he needs to go up to four and five mm -hmm. uh, lands and then it's more likely that he'll find a blue source this way. Also took down uh, three points of power. But Florian is, is very far ahead here in, in mana, yep. in... Board presence. Everything. Yep. But what so he doesn't have is uh, sideboard cards, I think. So he's, he's basically fighting with his, main uh, with his main deck configuration. Here's Ronus the Indomitable. Not going to be able to attack just yet, for two reasons. But summoning sick and no four power creatures here. Probably just making sure that it resolves. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Beesman's has an answer of any kind here. We'll see a uh, follow-up Greenbelt Rampager. Shy little elephant there. And in comes the Rampager and the Servant of the Conduit, clipping in for five here. Beesman's did manage to find that land. He cycled away like Cadell Evans and finally found a third time the charm. See if he can get to that fourth land, but already, yes, yeah, oh sorry, fifth, and yes, there it is, but already, I don't know, Teferi on this board is not an attractive proposition. But Valtor managed, like, aggressively cycling, not sacrificing Field of Ruins, uh, managed to draw himself out of his mana issues, and suddenly all his cards are alive, which, uh, compared to uh, two turns ago, is a big up upside. Yeah, but my point is this, if he had used the Field of Ruin on the Hash of Oasis, he would still be on five mana now. Yep, it would have been the, the much safer line. He would have taken more damage though. How so? Because he used his mana to, um, to seal away the scrounger. I see, I see. Yes, certainly. Well, m maybe it would have ended up being the same, but it, it wasn't guaranteed to, to work out this way. Yeah, the Hash of Oasis does give plus three, plus three. So I guess he's just... <laughs> He's uh, got the old payday loan on that three damage. And it might be repaid with interest by Koch in the coming turns. Now, Beesman's has finally hit his fifth land, has untapped with five, or well, the, the critical number here being four mana or more untapped. And I think Koch is going to pay the price here. It's a great time to fire off that Settle the Wreckage. But what, what is Koch supposed to do? Um, he could attack with only one creature, but your opponent is on 12. You have more fuel, so you don't really care about losing two of your creatures. Mm -hmm. And the most important piece of the puzzle, I think, at this moment is uh, Ronus. So attacking with both, getting two forests, and then uh, hopefully deploying two more, two more threads would definitely be, be a nice line here. See what Koch can uh, cook up here, Simon, post-settle the wreckage. Did you like my joke? I, I really did. Did you? I can see that by the very slight smile that is playing around the edges of your of your mouth there. Here's a scrap heap scrounger, and a green belt rampager. This time is going to stick around. Back to Beesman's now. I don't know what Beesman's means in Dutch. Mm, no, I don't think it's a. Um, 
well, how do you call that even? What is like the general term? For someone who keeps bees? No, no. <laughs> a beekeeper? <laughs> no. The, the work that somebody does, the job, the job description. Like oh, job description. Yeah. So like the yeah job title or something. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a beesman. Oh, interesting. Are there more than one of you? Yes, we are the beesmans. Not the beesmen? No, no, no. Don't be silly. So beesman has managed to get to six mana now with that planes double disallow available to him in addition to Teferi. Mm. But I mean, what does he do here? He still, he still doesn't have uh, yeah. that many blue sources. So, double double disallow is out of the question. Ah, sure. Also, not something he really wants to do because uh, what do you really achieve if you if you disallow on this board? Disallow the damage on the stack. Would that but have worked? You can <laughs> you can disallow the um, the activated ability of Ronas. So away goes the. Uh, no, that wouldn't have worked. Of course not. Away goes the field of ruin. Now, the best card ever printed, according to Simon Gertzen. I'm That's making fun of you, but broadly speaking, it, I, I think you're onto something. Because it is one of the most powerful constructed cards in the sense that it's a colorless land that goes in any deck. And that at, at the same time is like inherently balanced and yes. fair yes. And, and does things that we've seen cards do in the past, but with a really interesting twist that I think makes it uh, more interactive and, and actually more interesting for both, uh, both players. You involved. can see just how good the card is in the impact that it's had in modern whereas it is where it has eclipsed both um, ghost quarter and tectonic yep. edge and those cards have their issues just like wasteland and strip mine have their issues and i don't see those issues with uh, with field of ruin yeah field of ruin promotes a very healthy and balanced format it punishes you if you don't play basics which i think in modern is fantastic and uh again leads to more it leads to fewer non-games of magic where you can just wasteland someone out of the game Great job, R&D. Two thumbs up. Four thumbs up from me and Simon. Thoughts on Dust Bowl, Simon? <laughs> no. No? No thoughts to offer? I never got to play with this card. Yeah, that, that was the, the really fun days of Magic. Oh, really? Where it was all about just destroying all of your opponent's lands. Uh, all the time. So sad that we've moved away from these golden times. Oh, Florian Koch. He's channeled his inner Riley Knight and revealed some cards to his opponent. Yeah, he's also a bit flooded, as you can see. Well, keep an eye out for um, that in Walter Biesman's tournament report. But yes, uh, Alana Worrell's in a forest in hand here for Koch. He has got two of those lands from a Settle the Wreckage. Yep, absolutely. So maybe just drop a land and uh, intentionally drop a land and then activate Ronas on both of your creatures. It's a, it's a simple plan, but or, or just on one of your creatures and ask if you, go, if you are allowed to attack. Mm. This is the more defensive line playing around a second set of the wreckage. I don't know if my hand is if my hand is this weak. Mm. I think I'm I'm going for a more aggressive line. Well, let's see how he plays it out here. Beesman's does have the option to commit one of these creatures, and he's going to go after the scrap heap scrounger. But this clears the way for Koch to uh, slam in for a whole stack. He can double activate Ronus and get in for wow, how much is that? Seven. Seven? That's a big hit. It's the biggest hit. That's the biggest hit since the Beatles. You actually have to name a song by the Beatles, not just the okay. Beatles. Well, I don't know what their best, the be What was the best-selling Beatles single or, of all time? or album? You know, that's the biggest hit since Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yellow Submarine. I should have just gone for like that's the biggest hit like, since Despacito or something. Mm -hmm. that because been, then our, our, that our viewers would actually have known what yeah, you're talking that about. That would have been safer. That would have been much safer. Summer hit? Summer hit? Because it's summer. It is summer, yeah. yeah. Summer hits this year brought to you by Greenbelt Rampager. Get you for seven. On heavy rotation here at KWXRP. Here's Deferi. Going to tuck away that green belt rampager. Done a good job of clearing the board out here, has Beesman's. But now Ronas is ready to rumble. So, Koch with a Llanowars in hand. Yeah, that must... Is that going to get countered? I think Beesman's has to. No, but Beesman can't. Oh no, he can't. He, he doesn't get Because get Deferi doesn't always untap your lands. Yeah, Koch has it. Plays the Llanowars. Pumps it twice, active, uh, which makes uh, wakes up uh, the snaky boy, and then gets across for the final points of damage. Yep, beautiful, easy game. 
a work of art here by Florian Koch as Ronus the Indomitable lives up to his name and oh a sad shake of the head there for Walter Beesman's look at him con contemplating exactly where it went wrong I have to say he fought well fought hard but ultimately I think he, the hand that he had uh, just wasn't set up to answer the questions that uh, that Koch was asking of him and uh, not enough removal, too many counter spells, a few mana issues early on, and it just didn't line up for Beesman's there. I, I told you what we should look out for. We should look out for a search for Escanta, a uh, Glimmer of Genius, mm. an early Teferi. Instead, we saw mana issues, cycling a lot of cards, and then one for one removal. And, and uh, Florian played smartly around Settle the Wreckage. Mm -hmm. Not super scared, but exposing only two of his threats. He had enough to close out the game. He was running low on, on threats, right? We. We had him on nine lands and mm -hmm. just the Elves, but it was ex exactly enough to attack for lethal. Though. Ultimately enough to get him across the line. My friends, we're going to go take a quick break, but stick with us because after this, we'll be back with Time Walk Magic here from GP Brussels.
Welcome back to the tournament floor here at GP Brussels, my friends. We are winding up day number one with our second last round, round number seven. It is winning in Magic. You're with me, Riley, him, Simon. We do have a match with, uh, well, one of the uh, really very unknown but incredibly powerful uh, European wizards. We're going to head down to the feature match area and have a look at Jean-Emmanuel Deprat. Interesting story to emerge from the Pro Tour uh, last weekend, Simon. Uh, Jean-Emmanuel was one match away from qualifying four worlds. And it wasn't his own match. Yes. That's the best part. See him on a red-black chain whirler deploying a Heart of Kieran very early on. So Jean-Emmanuel de Praz would have appeared at the, uh, the World Championships in Vegas this year had Channel Fireball won their finals appearance because that would have put um, Ben Stark and Martin User into the PT slots rather than the, the pro point leader at large slots. That would have then freed up two slots that would have been occupied by Kelvin Chu, the world's finals from last year, and this Frenchman right here, Jean-Emmanuel de Praz. And what a story for him. A, a GP championship last year in Warsaw, uh, a pro to a top eight at uh, pro to arrivals of Ixalan. And uh, wow, I don't think this is the last we've seen of this young man. Absolutely not. He's um, slowly, quietly, uh, I have to say, very quietly, become one of um, Europe's best. Mm. He's, a quiet, he's a quiet and unassuming man and uh, generally is, is impressed most with, uh, with, his, with his conduct, both on and off the battlefield. Uh, his opponent is one of the old cast and crew. Baz Malice is a Dutch player of old. Uh, we uh, checked in with him in round number one, I believe, Simon. And we're back at it again now. He's improved to five and one. A great start for him. And, of course, a win here will secure a day two appearance for the Dutchman here. You, you are aware that the Netherlands were once one of the most fearsome magic nations in the world. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Not, just, not just nautically, but... Also magically. And then the, the, the magic-based tulip market crashed, and uh, now we're left with, well, what, Thomas yeah. Hendricks. And Frank Karsten. And Frank Karsten. On tax coverage. A poor consolation prize, it must be said. Rekindling Phoenix now for Jean-Emmanuel Duprat. Frank Karsten, uh, just to be clear, if the my irony-dripping voice wasn't quite enough, one of my very good friends, and certainly one of the greatest gifts to magic, and I guess, I guess Thomas Hendricks is all right as well. He's a glory bringer, but that's going to... Oh, no, not going to get eaten up by a seal away here. Ugh, Baz Malice's hand is a bit shocking here. Lots of lands. What a, what a curve out by Depra. Yeah, my goodness. Two, three, four, five. <laughs> oh, and uh, the next cur thing to curve is Baz Malice's uh, battlefield into his deck there. Oh, I thought you, weren't, you were going to say skull. Yes, that, that also, yes, the glory bringer coming in and taking a big chomp out of it. And Beaumont Courier kicking things off now for Dupra. You know, when, when you see these games, Red Black Chain Water is still pretty good. Yeah. Just all powerful cards it's across fail, the curve. It's fail safe as a 3 3 first strike. You know, I had someone uh, point something out interesting. I don't know if it was Twitch chat or on Twitter. Here's a cast down now to get rid of that Beaumont Courier. Um, Imagine if they'd made Goblin Chain Whirler a 3-1. Mm -hmm. So that you get the extra bit of Chain Whirler on Chain Whirler yeah. violence. Yeah, exactly. Just I don't, chains I don't think that would have been better. That would have been more, even more brutal. You think so? Yeah. I don't like it. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Well, I mean, I agree. I didn't like it either. I was pointing it out to say how dumb it was. I, mm -hmm. that's what I, yeah, that's what I think. Whoever said that on Twitter, ooh, I bet, bet you wish you hadn't done that now, seeing as you got so... Ruthlessly torn apart by Simon and also me, who definitely didn't agree with that opinion. Scrap Heap Scrounger getting across for three now. Melos down to 16 after the Courier already having poked in for some, uh, some, some damage. Cast Down is a... I don't know what to make of this removal spell, to be honest. Oh! Oh! Look at this! Duress! Duress safe. A duress proof hand. Yes! And Baz Melos, get around him. Look at him. What a legend. Yeah, he can't believe his luck. You have to do the double fist pump there. Yes, yes, it's an obligation. What do you think I cast down? Oh, not sure, yeah, honestly. Yeah, I really don't know. As a one-off, I can see it. Okay. It's, it's not what you want as your sort of prime removal spell. No, no, no. absolutely not. No. no. So many things that it doesn't hit that are so important. Carries Ev. And it's not like there is a shortage of removal spells in, in this standard yeah. format. It's funny when it got uh, previewed and we're all looking at it like, oh, it's Doomblade Plus, but just hasn't seen play. 
even in modern, it's just not good enough now that Fatal Push is a thing. Across comes the uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger. I don't no. know, maybe it needs to be explored more in modern, because it kills everything. Kills I, don't, I don't know. It, I think just killing a creature is, is just not enough for two mana. For two mana now, yeah. I mean, it just, it, I just like the way that it goes up against things like uh, Gurmag Angler. Sure, that, that's uh, an upside. Because yeah, Doomblade doesn't do that. I don't know. Occasionally those Jundi, Abzani type decks will sometimes play something like a Go for the Throat or a, or a Terminate usually mm -hmm. in Jund. I don't know. Cast Terminate, is Terminate is around. Mm. I think you can just play Maelstrom Pulse or, or yeah. something that costs a mana more but also deals with uh, permanence from the combo, combo yeah. decks. Yeah. Planeswalkers and enchantments, what have you. Here's another Duress. <laughs> Very what optimistic play from Dupra there. What a master. Yeah. Well, Bass had, has drawn two, two cards since then, and, right? And both of them are Duress proof. What a master indeed. Here's a Goblin Chain Whirler now. 3-3 three, three first strike. Going to get in for one. And Melos with another Duress proof. So Dupra's thinking, I'll get him this time. So guys, I know they're bringing in four Duress against me. Yeah. So I'm just bring, boarding out all my spells. <laughs> <laughs> bringing in 10 extra lands. They'll never suspect. Just, it's Lyra's and, yeah. Lyra's and Gearhog yeah, all the way. It. Yeah, look at this. He's sideboard. You're making. You're joking, right? Let's have a look at the sideboard. I, I of was until now, but let's have a look at the sideboard of Baddest Malos, shall we? We haven't got across this. Two Baral, four Glen Sleeve Siphoner, Gonti, Chromium. Don't worry about the other ones. But look at that duress-proof sideboard there. Whoa. It's got Infernal Reckoning as well. What's Infernal Reckoning? Infernal Reckoning is the one. The one. The one drop black removal spell that exiles a, a colorless creature and you gain life equal to oh, the... Oh, really? Yeah. I thought there was like a modern, barely playable... Yeah, like a plant against Eldrazi that isn't even being played. I guess it kills, what, Scrap Heap Scrounger? Yeah, it exiles Scrap Heap Scrounger. Heart of Kieran. Gain some life. I love it. I've completely turned around. Oh, duress off the top. Oh, no. Play it. Depress. My friend, you must play this duress. Two damage or... Or the big whiff. The best non-creature, non-land in Baz Melis's hand. Boo! Boo! Doesn't play it. Two damage upstairs to Baz Melis, down to four here. He's in a tough spot, actually, even with double gear hulk. He's got the cast down to remove one of those creatures, block the other one, but that Chandra is a ticking time bomb. Yeah, I think he top deck a Vraska's Contempt. So that might put him back into the game. Okay. Just barely. I kind of want to see him... Contempt and then Gearhog, but he probably has to Gearhog first. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Cast down. Because the best thing to do would be Gearhog, Contempt, Gearhog, Contempt. Very much the Helix, Snapcaster Helix. But the other line is still fine because he, d he will get the life taking down Chandra. Mm -hmm. He might even be able to um, entice a Trump block with the Gearhog. So this is a super interesting turn. Something like a Gearhog, Kill Your Chain Roller. Block your scrounger. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna block my gear hog or kill it somehow? Yeah. And then you still have the removal spell for the Chandra. The prize cycling away a uh, a canyon slough there. So close to victory as well. And Baz Melis, I tell you what, he runs with the best as we see the torrential gear hog now, and that's gonna be just how you lined it up there, Simon. He uh, was the runner-up along with. Coverage of his own. Frank Cast and Frankie Numbers uh, at GP Rotterdam 2016, uh, which you and I covered. Oh, really? Yeah. We're in the booth for that one together. And, uh, oh, a Doomfall. Not quite the duress here, but that's going to be a big play here for De Praz. As we see, Chandra has uh, taken care of that Torrential Gearhawk with her Flame Slash mode. But now you're priced into taking the, the Contempt. And just uh, trying to win with the Chandra, right? I don't think you can get, you can let your opponent have keep the answer to to Chandra. Yes, it's going to be the contempt, and the, and the problem here for Melis is that's now exiled. It's not just uh, not just discarded. Which of would course, be other, very, very otherwise different. otherwise it would have been a terrible choice. Of course, search for Azkanter off the top here. Melis needs a way to contest this Chandra, and he doesn't have one going to go upstairs next turn and a haste creature off the top Depraz is playing uh, Arncrop Crasher Glory Bringer doesn't look like Hazaret is in uh, 
is in contention. Here's a Beaumont Courier. That's another hasty boy. What do you go for here? You know, you know about the Gearhawk in hand, right? Yes. So I think you have to go for the two damage. Unless you, you drew nothing, then it's a lot more difficult. But then Melos can just play the Gear Hulk, smash the Chandra down to size. Oh, well, you can't attack with the career unless you I have see, something. And it carries F as well. Okay. No, even if you have something, you can't attack, of course. And ships. Torrential Gear Hulk. Why can't you attack with the career? Because it's then? just getting blocked by the Gear, by the gear oh, Hulk. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yep. It just flashes it in there. Yep. And Baz Melos now. Oh, this is super interesting. This is almost like a limited game where no player can attack because. Whoever moves first is exposing himself to, to just lose. But Melos is surely under more pressure thanks to the Chandra. Yes, but that's why Melis wants to take the Chandra. And, but if Depra loses the Chandra, then he's also kind of losing. But uh, Depra can just go upstairs with the Chandra twice. Yep. So assuming that Melis, because he's the control deck, will find something uh, within the next few doses. For example, if he place a uh, search for a scanter now mm -hmm. or rather if he attacks with the gear hawk then you're priced into chump blocking you're you're already priced into um into protecting your chandra at all costs i think so first up we're going to have a field of ruin the press floats of red i guess goes and finds a mountain metal step perhaps trying to thin his deck a little bit i don't really see the Utility in activating that there. Nothing else to do with his mana. I think thinning the deck is one thing. Getting a card into the graveyard for sure. um, that is actually for a search for a scanta. That's a good point. Oh, scrap heap scrounger. Very smart. Yep, floated a black from the uh, from the Dragon Skull Summit there. Didn't see that scroungerino hanging out in the, in the bin there. Maybe Buzz wanted to, or was hoping that he could uh, trick the Pras into. Uh, forgetting about this crown draw. I think he, he actually ju just has a fatal push. Although that didn't need enabling. Oh, and no. Okay, never mind. Now Buzz is just dead on board, right? It's got enough attackers as we see. Chandra go upstairs. Mountain does two. Melus on four. Melus is, of course, representing Settle the Wreckage here. Yes, very obviously as well, which I like. Depraz. Counting him up, trying to figure out what's the, the minimum attack that he has to to make to, to get him dead. Having a look at the bin. Four cards in it. Not enough to flip that search just yet. Not that uh, Melis, I think, is going to live to see another upkeep here. But it's, an, it's once again, it's one of, these, one of these super interesting spots where I don't think attacking with everything is, is correct. However, you do get the Bormit Courier, so maybe you want that extra card. And in this particular case, you know that Bass is uh, forced to block the Scrounger, which you're going to get back, and so on and so on. So Fatal Push, as you said there, takes care of Kari Zev, removing two attackers from the equation. And Baz Malice may indeed live to see another day after all. Oh, yep. Praz Ships, look Wha at this. What a nice dance. Beautiful little Samba going on between these two players. Maybe Flamenco, they are up nice and close and personal, aren't they? Melis now. Oh, tanking on this like it's a Terminus. <laughs> Although if it were a Terminus, I think it'd be a pretty easy decision. Or maybe not, actually, no. No, <laughs> he's just dead to the Chandra. Wow. So so the thing is here, there's only the Bormit Courier to block the Gear Hulk. Mm -hmm. And if you find something like a Vraska's Contempt, in theory, it would do everything you need, but then... Ooh, Teferi. Well, Teferi always does everything you need. Yes, and ch tucks away the Chandra here. So Bass is virtually on one life. Yes. And he knows that three cards down, there is a lethal threat, but Depra can only get two cards deep with his Bormite Courier this turn. Whew. It doesn't get much closer than it this. It doesn't get much closer than this. What did Depra find? Was that just a mountain? Didn't get a good look at it. And so here we have Bormite Courier going after Teferi. An easy block here for, well, a force block, more or less. We know that Depraz was, was always going to be able to get that Teferi off the table. It's an ether hub for Depraz. So, gains an energy. Bomat Kuru with one card underneath it. So, he's got Chandra on top. Mm -hmm. And the Scrounger can come back. In the graveyard, yes. So, off the top, Basmalis gets to look at the top two cards of his library here. 
Well, I, I should say, he, he gets access to one of the top two. He doesn't get to look at them both at the same time. That'll be a lot better. It's another Teferi! It's insane that this game is still going on. That's crazy! Is there any way to survive, though? He has to chain something from the Teferi, oh, you right? Keep, you, have to, you keep the Teferi and you hope to yeah. draw... Um, like anything. You, you hope to draw a counter spell. And you have to dodge the Bowman Courier from delivering something. Really yes, fun. as well, in the, in the post bag, yes. So Teferi has to go upstairs here. Draws a card. Didn't see what it was. Of course, we know that Depraz has a Chandra, a Torture Defiance, on top of his deck. Melus thinking twice about how to untap his lands. Ships it back to Depraz, who reanimates this Scrap Heap Scrounger. Does Melus have something, or is this just the big pump fake here from the Dutch player? Chandra off the top for Depraz. We knew about that one. And Melis, he's got to have, as you say, a counter spell and a way to deal with both of these attackers. Well, he's not dead to the. Well, sorry, he doesn't need to. He doesn't just just needs to block the uh, the old Scroungerino here, because he is still on two. The Bowman Courier went after the previous Deferi last turn, saving him a point of life. Four mana. What could it be? It's Chandra. Torture Defiance. We knew that. Of course, it was tucked away. And Melis, oh, 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 one more card. What is it? The resolves upstairs doesn't have. It's got a torrential gilk. Oh, it's not enough. And off the top, a duress chooses not to cast it, and two damage. He results in a big win from Jean Emmanuel de Pra. I mean, whew, take a moment to breathe out there, get the heart rate down a little bit, Simon. After that heart pump, there was a, match. Fun, a fun game. That to was watch. a good fun game. Yes, indeed, good honest magic there. And as you say, kind of playing out like this weird kind of limited game. Well, a first bit. we had all this duress, and oh, that was the. Yeah. I mean, the control deck is not happy, of course, to not have anything to do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if your opponent is spending cards that don't hit anything, you're al also doing quite well. And that's why it was so tight in the end. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, a very, a very interesting texture of that game. We do have more Time Walk Magic for you, though, my friends. Some good news for fans of Magic around the world. The hits don't stop. Round number seven continues now with our next Time Walk Magic. We're going to get that loaded up and have a look at it. Um, White Blue Control, obviously my deck of choice in every format ever. I think... It seems to have all the tools that it needs against this current standard format, but it keeps falling short by by inches. Mm -hmm. You know, it's never really completely out of it, as we saw there, Melis holding on for quite a long time. Is there anything, you know, if you could add a card, right, or just an effect or something to Blue White Control, just to give it that extra leg up, what is it? What is it the biggest thing that it's missing? Hmm. I think it's the fact that your card draw costs four. Yeah. Um, it's a very simple equation, but the cheaper you can get this card advantage going, the better it is usually for control decks in, in any form. And also the threats of the other decks are really, really scary right now. So even something like a... Well, not divination, but like Not divination, but something yeah. a like a powerful divination. Yeah, 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 something like that, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, let's crack on, my friends. We've got another Time Walk match to bring you here between between uh, Francesco Giorgio and Emmanuel de Wolf. I'm going to kick things off now with Turbo Fog and Red Black Chain Whirler. Very interested to see how this one pans out. We haven't had uh, too much Turbo Fog on the screen mm -hmm. so far this weekend. I can tell you that missing your second land drop is not the best way to go. So playing Turbo hang Fog. On, hang on, back up, back up. You lost me here. So the Turbo Fog deck does want to hit land drops every turn? It does It does want to hit your, uh, their land drops. And not playing a second land on turn number two is a... Good, not, bad, not very good. bad thing. Bad. It's a bad thing. Bad thing. That's what I was going to say. So uh, yeah, uh, Francesco Giorgio maybe already has taken a mulligan. I think it's hard to keep a one lander <laughs> when you've got a fresh six or seven. Uh, so uh, yeah, might be paying the uh, paying the price for that. Paying the iron price here. As DeWolf goes from strength to strength now. Look at that, just spewing cards onto the battlefield. Generating mana with Chandra. Yep, I love it. The hidden mode, the underused mode there, as far as uh, as you're concerned, there, Simon. You know, with Teferi, you always make two mana. And with Chandra, people just want extra cards. Yeah. And Teferi does both. Yeah. Francesco Giorgio, unable to keep up, unsurprisingly, with that onslaught there. And so we're going to jump across, ladies and gentlemen, to game number three. We do have round eight coming your way before very much longer. So we will skip game number two there. Looks like Giorgio managed to take it out. And so now the decider between Giorgio and DeWolf. And as I say, round number eight coming your way. You can see... Raph Levy and Tim Willoughby at the moment. They're just warming up, doing some squats. 
doing some push-ups, some sit-ups, getting nice and... This is not a joke, actually, by the way, Simon. I woke up this morning and Raphael Levy was in it on the floor of our hotel room doing push-ups. He's a machine. He is a machine. Beep boop. Robot Levy. He was doing sit-ups as I left. The man but does m- not More stop. like ninja killer machine. Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know, Raph Levy is a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He was a, the French national champion of, uh, of the sport a couple of years ago. And I have had more than one physical contest with him. And that's all I'm prepared to say on the matter. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who wins or who loses. It's about taking part, Simon. Bomo Curia now off of an ether hub. And it carries to follow things up now. Nice aggressive start for DeWolf. That's what he wants. Doesn't want to give Giorgio too much breathing room to, uh, to get his engine online. Because once it starts turning over, whew, it's hard to come back from. And he is holding, maybe a bit luckily, luckily, his one sideboard card, Insult to Injury. Yes, this is a card that I think Brad Nelson tweeted about earlier in the, uh, in the, ra- in the, in the round, in the week, as a, as a way to punch through damage on a key turn, even th- in the face of something like a fog. Is this some kind of sport where you tweet about things that crush Turbo Fog? I guess so, First, yeah. everyone tweets about how broken it is, and then everybody tweets how to beat it. Yeah, it's like tennis. You know, you're hitting the, 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 the conversation yeah. ball back and, uh, back and forth across the net. Anything for those likes and retweets. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's shameful, isn't it, Simon? Kids these days with their Snapchat filters and their Facebook-like algorithms. I don't understand it. Back in my day, we had custom HTML on MySpace pages, and we were grateful for it. Here's a Haze of Pollen now, going to prevent this uh, big attack from DeWolf. Already uh, firing off a Haze of Pollen for seven points of damage there. Yeah. Quite the early um, fog. Got a second one in hand here. And DeWolf gets a look at what uh, Giorgio is working with thanks to a Doomfall here. But especially when you, when you know you're facing um, a lot of discard, I, I like to wait with my uh, fog effects until it's absolutely necessary to use them. Of course, you don't want to expose yourself to burn spells, but going down to something like 9 or 8 is easily possible. Yeah, it's super, super cool card there. Bounty of the Luxa. Mm. And I think that's actually the reason for the early fog. Because mm, he's going to take next turn off to cast that. Yeah, so kind of um, buying yourself time, buying yourself mana uh, yep. f- for a later turn. Pre-fog. An early fog. So... Bounty of the Lux, I've seen that in, in some lists, but I, uh, I thought that the evolution of the Turbo Fog that had already gotten as far that Bounty of the Lux was one of these w- w- one-offs, fun-offs that didn't quite make it. Mm. Emmanuel, though, is studying it, even though there's t- a Teferi in hand, which is mo- generally the card you want to take. Looks like Teferi is going to hit the Exile Zone now. Uh, not, not a difficult choice. DeWolf certainly took his time in making it, however. I think he just wanted to make absolutely sure to understand what the bounty does. Okay, sure. For those who don't know, the, the Cliff Notes version is it gains mana every turn and, or every other turn and draws a card every other turn. Yeah, a bit of a complicated templating, mm. but once you understand what it does, it's actually uh, relatively Yeah, basically, clear. you draw a card you didn't gain mana last turn, or sorry, if you gained mana last turn, and vice versa. It's cool. Cool card. Play it in EDH. Get wrecked all the time. So, Emmanuel has 4 plus 3, 7 points of damage, which means insult to injury is definitely not threatening lethal this turn. There's also a hazard, but the hazard is not going to be able to attack this turn, which doesn't mean it's a bad play. It's, uh, it's just not as good as it could be. So DeWolf having another read of this card. It is a little bit of a, uh, a Tolstoy-esque masterpiece. It does have a lot of text on it. I, I shudder to think at how long the German version is. Mm-hmm. The good thing in Limited, you usually just lost to it. You didn't, you didn't have to Oh, you didn't have to read it. Read. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just like, very much, you know, it's like a, like a palace or citadel siege. Just play it and like, okay, right, yeah, whatever. Here's an insult. Eh? Really? Well, I don't, I don't get it. I can't, uh, what? It does has it. It does have its uses here, but isn't it a bit premature? Can you 
Can you injury without a target? I'm going to just double check the text of this card. So just doing double damage here. How, what, what does uh, injury so say? Insult says damage can't be prevented, deal double, double damage. Injury says it deals two damage to target creature and two damage to target player or planeswalker. Okay, in that case it makes sense because you can target your own creature ah, sure, 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 sure. and the opponent's uh, face. Okay, so this, this means that the injury now is lethal yeah. because... Yeah, Dwarf could just target, for example, his own carries there. But Th then it's all fine. I, I thought it was sense. more right. like uh, the Searing Blaze effect. Yes, Where yeah. you have to have a creature on the opposing side. Yes, exactly. But no, 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 that's not uh, that's not the case. It can be two separate mm -hmm. targets. Yeah, all right. That makes a lot more sense. Here's Charter Calls it's now for Giorgio. It's any one creature and any one face. Yes, yeah. Or player or planeswalker slash, and then on the other side of it, creature. Yeah, you need those uh, separate targets. But yeah, it looks like it's all good. And Giorgio may be going down in flames here after insult to injury. The Bard Narsen special... Might get Dwarf across the line there. Makes a lot of sense. And of course, that huge, big attack. Meaning that uh, even a, uh, a fog effect would have been no good for Giorgio. Because, of course, damage can't be prevented. And Emmanuel wouldn't have done that uh, for only, let's say, one damage less. Because okay. bringing Giorgio to three with uh, injury in the graveyard is almost worthless. Dwarf? Cycling away that Bomac Courier, discards Hazard and a Scrap Heap Scrounger, finds a couple of other artifacts as well, but it looks like it's just going to be an injury here to close out the game. Any reason not to do it? I guess counter magic? No, I don't. If, if Georgia counters, then he's dead to the, to the creatures exactly. on the battlefield. Yeah. So we're going to see a Bomac Courier first off. DeWolf playing very, very conservatively indeed. In come the creatures. Georgia are going to be forced to, uh, to fire off this Haze of Pollen here, or Root Snare instead, I should say. No damage done, but an insult to injury from the bin. Two damage to my Kari Zev. Two damage to your face. Looks like we got another reader here, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, this seems to be, by my accounts, the uh, a game-winning play. And an extension of the hand is going to wrap things up for Francesco Giorgio to go down two games to one to Emmanuel DeWolf. And that is that. That's all she wrote for round number seven, my friends. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more magic after this, we've got round number eight. We've got more win and ins uh, with Tim and Raph. That's it for Simon and me for today, but we will see you back here bright and early tomorrow. Stick around for the final round of coverage here at GP Brussels. We'll be back after this.